Welcome to Worship at Bethel, originating from Bethel Lutheran Church in Madison, Wisconsin. Bethel Lutheran Church is a vibrant urban congregation, living lives of worship and praise, loving one another through faith, community, and care, serving all and God's world, and thriving by faithful stewardship. Our mission is loving and serving Jesus Christ and the world. Welcome, good people of God, in the name of the one who comes into our world to rouse us from our sleep and to invite us into God's plan for the world, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you this day that you stir us, you rouse us, you bring us to a new awareness of your presence in our world. And we ask, O oh Lord, that this day that you would reach deep into our spirits and to wake us fully that we might come alive in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and also with you. Rouse our hearts, Lord God, to prepare the way of your only Son. By his coming, awaken us to serve you with holy lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Oh, 
the Holy Gospel is a reading from Mark, the first chapter. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all of the people around Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the gospel of the Lord. May grace and peace be yours in abundance, in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ, our Lord. I was watching a World War II movie a few weeks ago. Early on in the movie, I don't even remember the title of the movie, but early on in the movie, an American soldier was captured by a, Germ by a group of German soldiers. And ultimately, he ended up being interrogated by a German officer who spoke English. The German officer asked the, the soldier, why are you fighting? Why are you, you know, fighting for the Amer Americans? And, you know, he said, he's an American. And he, was, he said, I am fighting for freedom like we have in America. Freedom, the German officer responded sarcastically. I have lived in your free America, he said. For 10 years, I lived in your America, American South where your own black citizens could not eat in the same restaurants or drink from the same water fountains as whites. Freedom, the officer then just scoffed. I didn't much like that, that scene in that movie. <laughs> And I really didn't like that German officer. But if, as I thought about it, I guess the scene did what the director intended it to do. It stayed in my head, and it made me think. It made me think about what that German officer said, and it made me realize that there was a bit of truth, maybe a lot of truth behind his words. It forced me to wrestle with the fact that we humans, Americans, Germans, or whomever, over the course of our interactions with other humans, we, we tend to have problems. And those problems only seem to intensify when the other is somehow different. Consider that time in the United States, the 1930s and, and the 40s. If you were different, say a person of color, your sense of freedom, your access to freedom, and your opportunities to experience freedom were very likely limited. Of course, that truth sadly extended to other people as well. It is not a pleasant thing to think about, but the mistreatment of some that took place within our own country at that time was significant, not to mention the mistreatment of people in other parts of the world. Mistreatment to those who were different seemed to not only be tolerated in much of our country, but at times it seems that it was almost encouraged and perhaps even supported by people in authority. I guess that director of that movie did a good job creating that scene because it sure did get me thinking. Eventually, as I was wrestling with all of that, as I was doing all that pondering, I got to thinking about someone from my own family. One of my uncles, Uncle David. Uncle David was my mom's first of two brothers. Uncle David was born in 1937, two years after my mom and two years before his, their brother, John, my Uncle John. Uncle David, my mom, and the rest of their family lived in Joliet, Illinois, just southwest of Chicago, now considered a suburb. I believe back then it was its own little city. There's one more important thing that I should tell you about Uncle David, at least for this Advent story that I'm going to share with you today. Uncle David was born with Down syndrome. That made Uncle David, at least in Joliet, Illinois, in 1937, different. Very different. He was a round peg, 
that was supposed to fit into a square peg, and it just did not work. He was blessed with a mom, my grandma Edith, who was a loving woman and a kindergarten teacher. When Uncle David was five years old, Grandma Edith made sure that he was enrolled in the classroom that she taught. From what my mom told me, it was not uncommon for children with Down syndrome and other kinds of physical challenges to simply not go to school. Typically, such children were sent off to homes or facilities with other children facing those same kind of challenges. But Grandma Edith was a teacher, a little bit stubborn, and her sister, great aunt Holda, was the principal of that school, so Uncle David attended kindergarten. But as the year progressed, the PTA, other parents, the school board, and many of the teachers complained about Uncle David's presence at the school. They felt he made the other children nervous, and, and the parents were concerned that their children would be negatively impacted by, by Uncle David's presence. That same kind of complaining or concern was voiced by some of my grandparents' neighbors. They too had issues with Uncle David being so close, so close to their children and so close to their homes. By the end of his kindergarten year, it was clear to my grandparents that Uncle David could not return to that school or any other school in Joliet. And even worse, it was clear that for David to have any kind of a life where he could truly thrive, he would need to be removed from normal society. So they, they, they began to look for a home for him, just like so many other parents with special needs children were forced to do in those days. My grandma and grandpa visited many facilities and homes to determine what would be the best fit and the safest and fit and the closest place for their now six-year-old son to live. I don't remember all the places that my mom told me that her parents visited, but I remember her telling me about one facility in Illinois that was close to their home that initially excited them because it was so close. I remember my mom telling me how her mom told her about that facility years after their visit. With tears, Grandma Edith described to my mom the discipline method that this facility used to treat these children. With pride, the man told my parents that they would vary their treatments with the children between beatings and electric shock to determine which worked best. After much searching, my parents settled on Bethphage Mission in Axtell, Nebraska, some 650 miles from Joliet. Bethphage Mission was established in the early 19, 1900s by Reverend K.G. William Dahl and his congregation who would, that he was serving in Axtell. It was a congregation that was part of the Lutheran Church, the Augustana Lutheran Church, a group of Swedes. Bethphage, Bethphage Mission began as an institution for the care of people with epilepsy, but very quickly they were opening their doors to people who were deemed different in other ways as well. Linda Timmons, who is the president and CEO of Mosaics, which is what Bethphage Mission is now called, said this about Bethphage Mission and the work of its founder, Reverend Dahl. Pastor Dahl's vision for Bethphage was it to be, was it be, to be a place where everyone was accepted. He welcomed people with epilepsy, people who had no other home, people whose disabilities left them disfigured or unable to speak, people who needed someone to remind them that they are lovable. That early Bethphage was a place where everyone came together as a community and helped one another. The people who came there to live experienced hospitality based in love, not hostility because they were different, end quote. I kind of laugh when I hear people talk about the evils of political correctness and then suggest that it was it's some kind of recent idea invented by a certain portion of the media or the politically, political elite. I laugh because as I think about it, polit political correctness, or at least that idea, maybe not the term, 
it has existed in our country since its very inception. How it has played out and who benefits from political correctness, those are actually the only things that are different. As defined, political correctness is language, policies, or measures that are intended to avoid offense or disadvantage to members of particular groups in society. So the particular group or groups in society change over time, certainly. The purpose does not. The goal of political correctness is to protect this designated group or groups from offense or being disadvantaged, whatever that group happens to be. Clearly, back in Uncle David's time when he was a child, the great concern was not to offend those beholden to the status quo. If a person did that, if a person somehow upset the apple cart, upset the status quo by being different, it was too often the case that that person needed to go. And the process of making sure that that person was gone in order to avoid offending others was done through the language, the policies, and the ideas of the time. So the politically correct thing to do back then was to identify and lift up differences within people, not in an effort to celebrate and appreciate them, but far too often in an effort to isolate and separate. Those who were seen as different were far too often hidden away in facilities, shamed into hiding who they truly were or forced to live only in certain parts of communities. Thus creating this idea, this image that society was made up of only normal people, which meant people that looked like us. As I mentioned last week, I'm a big fan of rock and roll. And I've decided to use these last three sermons that I'm preaching to you know, pick um, sermon titles and then connect them with rock and roll songs, both as a way to kind of note some songs I love, but also as a way to kind of help, that, help us understand the story, help you understand the story I'm sharing a little bit more. The sermon title today is you've got to hide your love away. So if you recognize that song title, type it in in Facebook and, and, and see if you're right, and I'll let you know later. But I picked that, that title because in such a it kind of it, in a haunting way, it tells the story of how my parents journeyed to find a place for their son. They hid their love, their son, away at Bethphage Mission. Fortunately, they found a safe place there, a wonderful place. And my uncle David thrived there until his death in his mid-70s. But the reason for that wonderful place, the reason that it was needed, was absolutely shameful. The strong desire to have things seem nice and normal, to appear safe and happy, obviously very reasonable desires, even admirable. It's nice to have a pretty picture, but the question is at what cost? Well, at least some of the cost was borne back then on the backs of any and all people who were considered in one way or another different. The cost was hiding away all those who made that pretty picture a little less enjoyable to look at. Before we get carried away with pointing our finger at those people back then, we too have those same issues. We too have that desire to want a pretty picture of the world, to have the world around us seem normal, content, maybe even great, just the way we think it should be. We too want to paint over all whom we might wish to, we could just you know, eliminate or, or at least paint over, forget about for a while, ignore those people, dismiss those folks, people we think may make the picture look a little less attractive. There's only one problem with wanting to do that. God says, tough luck. There is no hiding away my loves, my children. God says, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me, John the Baptist says. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. That one is Jesus. The one sent from God who is more powerful than John the Baptist, who baptizes with the Holy Spirit, who is called the King of Kings and the Lord, Lord of Lords. That one knelt down 
that one came into our society and was loving all those we try to hide away. That one, Jesus, loved the unlovable, healed the sick, welcomed the outcast, wept for those who grieved and associated with all who are at the bottom of the social barrel. Our pretty pictures of the world may need to be touched up a bit, and while challenging, that's okay. We may need to add some, add some color, some depth, and some perspective to our little pictures. And with those additions to each of our little pictures of the world, something wonderful happens. Ultimately, the true beauty of God's creation begins to be revealed. And no one is hidden away. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always and also with you. This is a time when we would often share the peace of Christ with one another, with those in your room. Look across the room, look next to the chair next to you, and just tell them peace of Christ be with you. Give them a wink, a nod, a hug, a kiss. And we also at this time will receive an offering. And if you want to take a moment and pull your phones out and just text a gift to the church, grab your checkbook, fill out your check, uh, make arrangements for your online giving, we will receive our gifts now.
let us pray. The gracious God, we give you thanks. The ways that you work in our lives and you bring about hope and healing, abundance and praise. Receive these gifts, Lord, today as our offering to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. After he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Since we knew in summer that we would likely not be able to meet in person for some time, uh, Amy Hartzell, our director of music, uh, put together a tremendous gift for all of us. And it is our very Bethel Christmas CD. Uh, we'll bring it to you. Much of this was recorded right here in this space. Also, we want to pay a special note and give special attention to the fact that next Sunday is Pastor John's last Sunday here at Bethel. Been over 26 years plus and been so faithful and, and Christ-like in his service here. And next Sunday is his last Sunday. He will be taking a new call after the first of the year to Emmanuel in, in Watertown. But next Sunday, we, we're going to give him his gifts from the church. And, and we've been receiving cards and letters to the church and, and invite you to keep doing that. If you haven't yet, this is the week to do it. So don't, don't hesitate. Don't wait. Do it today. And we invite you all to send in a gift of some sort, a lovely letter, a card, a gift card, a check. Uh, we want to give Pastor John a nice farewell gift in recognition and appreciation for his many years of service here. And next Sunday, too, we'll have a, a laying on of hands service to bless Pastor John with Godspeed and to send him on with our support and love and his new mission. So please join in next Sunday. Send in your cards. We'll lay those out here uh, during church so that you can feel good about uh, our support for John and his family. So now for the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Worship at Bethel originates from Bethel Lutheran Church in Madison, Wisconsin. We invite you to join us in person for worship and fellowship. Thank you for your continued support and join us next week for Worship at Bethel.